I grew up in Switzerland, which is possibly, you know, the most, well, along with Norway, the most prosperous country on earth. Many of the problems that exist politically in everywhere else around the world just don't exist. There are no debates about education, there are no uh, problems about hospitals or deficits, etc. And yet, people are not necessarily happy. And this really interests me because for most countries, to get to be like Switzerland is an amazing ambition. I think a prosperous country like Switzerland allows you all kinds of freedoms. Your, your life is free of a lot of encumbrances and difficulties that otherwise exist. You know, I spent some time last year in Uganda, and what strikes you, you know, if you spend time in somewhere like Uganda is so many things that just don't exist as problems in the rich world are, are the work of days and weeks getting a stamp, getting a message, getting a permit, you know, talking to somebody. These things are major hurdles. Getting some water. These things are all major hurdles. And we are simply, in the rich world, able to do so much more with our lives. And this is the kind of tragedy of poverty, really, is that it slows you down. It's like a giant break that at every turn, you know, stops the gap between what you want and what you can do. But when you grow up in Switzerland, you see even there, there are all sorts of problems. And what are these problems? These problems are broadly speaking in the emotional area. So Switzerland has quite a high suicide rate. It has a very high divorce rate. Um, it has quite high rates of anxiety and depression and all of these things. And this got me thinking, looking at a particular set of problems which is in the kind of emotional arena. When I was a young guy, you know, one of the first things I worried about when I got to university was what am I going to do after university? Um, I was very interested in, you know, what I could do because I realized that a conventional job was going to be tricky for me. I'm a very conventional person. I love to be conventional um, and I would have loved to be an accountant, but somehow it just didn't quite work with my own kind of inner emotional function. I wish it had because frankly my life's been difficult, more difficult than it would have been if I just kept my head down and be a good boy and become a doctor or a lawyer or accountant. Um, and what was driving me was a kind of impulse to try and sort out emotional issues, my own and those of others around me. And it was just, it was a drive stronger than me. Um, I didn't want it to be there, but it was there. And for me, I had a hunger always to try and analyze situations. I was an intellectual, not because I wore black clothes or sat in a cafe smoking gitane and reading Sartre. That's not being an intellectual. I was an intellectual because I needed to spend a part of every day alone thinking uh, and reading and analyzing ideas. And to this day, what I love more than anything else, what calms me down, is to analyze things and situations. And I thought, well, that's not a job. Well, what does that mean? Um, and uh, then, you know, normally these types are steered towards books. And um, I thought, oh, maybe I should, you know, try and write a book. And I'd done very well at university in a very conventional way. And so the path seemed to be to go into a university setting and become a professor, etc. And I started down that path, but it all came down to the shoes. I remember looking at the shoes of the professor that was teaching me, and they were so unfashionable. They were so violently resistant to elegance that I thought, I don't know if I want to spend time, I don't know if, well, if I want to be him. Um, he, he looks so unstylish. Now, again, I'm not a very stylish person, but I'm interested in style because style is, again, an attempt to seduce and communicate. And the university, its buildings, its clothes, sends out a message, we don't care. We don't care about beauty. We don't care about style. You come to us because we're serious. And this seemed wrong to me. I, it just smelt wrong. Look, I was 21. I didn't really know. But sometimes when you're young, you have to go by your nose. You smell. It smelt a bit wrong. I didn't really know what, exactly why. So then I thought, OK, I'm going to get a normal job. But before I get a normal job, I'm just going to try and write a book because that's really what I want to do. I, I lost my hair very young. So suddenly, when I was 20, I lost all my hair. So suddenly, I looked like an old man. And it made me think about death. And it made me think, whoa, you know, I, I, was, I no longer felt 20. I, I suddenly felt 45 because all my hair had fallen out. It was really weird. So it made me more, more serious. And I thought, OK, well, given that life is short and already I've kind of like jumped ahead, like, what am I going to do? So I thought, I really want to write a book. So I wrote my first book, which was a book analyzing love. It was called Essays in Love. And look, frankly, I didn't quite know what I was doing. I was just led by instinct. and. 
you know, hard work. And this book became a big bestseller for me. And it was a great surprise. Suddenly I was 22 and, well, you know, this looked kind of serious. And um, it was the beginning of a strange career, you know, where I've just um, made it up, you know. And as I say, I can't stress enough how conventional I am. I want to be so conventional, but I've been forced into this life by my own temperament, which is extremely entrepreneurial and creative because at every turn, the things that I really want to do don't seem to have an easy box. You know, I wanted to make television programs, but I didn't fit naturally the normal television program that you make. I wanted to um, start a business, but the business I wanted to start was not necessarily the normal one. So at every turn, I've had to slightly reinvent um, in order to try and kind of match what's inside me with the world. Philosophy is, is, is busted, it's at an end, it's broken. And the reason is that the universities have seized this subject and they have made it into the most boring subject on earth. So philosophy used to be the place that you would look at after religion or alongside religion to answer the biggest questions. What are we here for? What do we do about suffering? How can we understand love? What about sex? What about beauty? Um, money, all these things used to be philosophical questions. This subject, which was a beautiful guiding light, has been killed by academics. So university philosophy is not the answer. There is an older tradition of philosophy outside the university. This is the philosophy of Socrates, of Nietzsche, of Schopenhauer, of uh, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre. These are all people who lived outside of universities and they have the best ideas. And my career in relation to philosophy has been to say, Listen guys, we have to try and go back to what the philosopher was in ancient Greece. The philosophers in ancient Greece were meeting business people, politicians, they were advising governments, they were helping people to think about their relationships, about the direction of the state, etc. And this has been my goal. So if I go into number 10 and advise David Cameron, which I've done, or if I go into um, you know, a, 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 a business, which I've done, etc., I'm thinking back, not forward, I'm thinking back to this is the traditional mission of philosophy, to um, be people who help in this weird thing called thinking. You know? it, it, it's odd because we think of thinking as the easy bit. But you'll know that in businesses and other strategic decisions, often the thinking part goes by really fast and no one's really looking after it. Technology, someone's looking after. Marketing, someone's looking after. Who's the head of thinking in the organization? Oh, well, we all think, don't we? Well, really? Yeah. H how much are you thinking, really? And how, you know, in what kind of depth and rigor? We do not have departments for thinking in our large organizations. This is a problem we should. We have the idea of the specialist. This never really suited me. I have a, a, a vagabond intelligence that wants to you know, skate over a lot of things, but there is something that holds all my interests together, broadly speaking, and that is the good life, the fulfilled life. And my first question in any area is, what is the good version of this? So if I see people bringing up children, my first question is, what is it like to bring up a child well? What, what, what should go right? And also, what goes wrong? What are the problems and pains in the area of child raising? Or we're in a hotel now. What's a good hotel? What's a bad hotel? What's a good business? What's a bad business? I'm interested in suffering and pleasure and analyzing the sources of suffering and pleasure in a wide variety of fields. I started the School of Life because I realized that in order to have power in the world, um, ideas often need institutions. Ideas on their own are very easy to get lost. Institutions, even though the romantic philosophy suggests that institutions are always corrupt and bad and boring, in fact, they are vital carriers of things. They're agglomerations of people that can make certain things more powerful in the world. So I realized that rather than just writing books, I should also start an institution. And the School of Life does everything I do in my books. It looks systematically at the great problems of emotional life, um, and it does its output is very varied. It makes films, it um, writes books, publishes books, it has a, a very lively online uh, presence. We consult with businesses in the area of emotional life. We offer psychotherapy and various kinds of therapy to the general public, and we offer classroom-based teaching. We have now 10 branches around the world, and we, are, we also make retail products of all, all kinds. And the, the ambition is really to create a brand around emotional intelligence and well-being. 
And it's an area where up till now we've had a lot of gurus and inspirational figures, one-off people, charismatic people, maybe who have a very big following, but always based on one person. And the idea with the School of Life is to, it's really a team. <music> Plato famously said that the world would only come right when kings became philosophers or philosophers kings. What he meant by that was you need to ally ideas with power and power with ideas. Um, replace the word, you know, kings are not so powerful nowadays. What is the king now? Kings are CEOs. Kings are, are business leaders. And um, I suppose I'm very attracted to the power that these people have, not for personal enrichment or fame or anything like this, but in order to have an impact with people's lives. And what really pains me is to see that very often the best ideas are around, but no one's listening to them. Whereas, you know, the big engines of the world, the big show is being led by people with no spiritual or emotional ambitions. And I suppose I want to try and bring them together. I would like the vigor, the scale, the organizational capacity of business allied with the intellectual seriousness, the spiritual ambition uh, and the emotional intelligence of the philosophical and psychological world. I would like those two to be united. And when young people come to me and they say, look, I'm really interested in what you're doing. I don't know what to study at university. I'm deciding whether to study English literature or maybe philosophy. And I say, no, study management. Go and be a lawyer. Uh, you know, come and do uh, you know, some of the hard technical skills, then come back and see us. Because what we really need at the School of Life, what I really need around me, are not another poet or another philosopher. We have enough of those, we have tons of those. What we really need are people who are sympathetic to what we do, but with extremely hard-headed uh, technical skills. And this is what we're trying to do that is new. Um, and I always try and surround myself with people who are not necessarily, uh, particularly from a humanities background, um, maybe sympathetic on the weekend to this, but are very pragmatic. We find that people have really two problems when they come from the members of the general public, uh, relationships and work. And what goes wrong in relationships is they either can't find someone or the person that they're with, they can't be happy with them. And um, this is because of an overwhelming idea in the world that it's easy to find love and it's easy to make relationships work. It isn't, it needs a lot of skills, a lot of patience, a lot of, a, a, a lot of an awareness that you're you know, dealing with something that's much more complicated than learning to play the violin. You would never pick up the violin and go, ooh, I can't play, what's wrong with my violin, I'll get another violin. It's like, no, you know, try and figure out how this thing works. In love, I think the real challenge in love is to uh, find another person who you admire and need. And the reason that you need them is that they bring you things that you are not capable of uh, and that you like. Uh, and even better, they like you and you don't have an impulse to destroy them uh, and they don't have an impulse to destroy you. The impulse to destroy being very strong in love. There's some, for all sorts of reasons, we are very destructive around the people that we feel strongest about. Um, these are very, very high ambitions indeed. Um, we will fail, by definition, in some areas. Uh, religion, the Christian church, used to have a very beautiful idea that human beings are all broken and we need God to complete us and to heal us and we need his mercy and forgiveness. I'm a secular Jew, I believe none of it, but I love this language because I need it in my own life and I recognize that other people need it. We all need forgiveness and help with the broken bits of us. I think happiness in the world of work means doing justice to what you feel to be your genuine talents. Our genuine talents are not things that announce themselves very clearly. Here are my genuine talents. We feel them. Uh, we feel them late at night, we feel them as we wake up in the morning, we feel them on Sunday afternoons, we feel them sometimes when we envy people and we think, ah, oh, there's something, I recognize an echo of my genuine talent in that other person. And I think one of the great tasks of life is to assemble a coherent picture of this hitherto jumbled collection of signs of, of your genuine talent. A good life is when you're able 
to exploit your genuine talent and be recognized for doing so by the world and ideally make some money from it because money is an important currency. Um, I think that this you know, is a situation of great fulfillment. Very few people get there. Um, it's just very hard, you need a lot of luck and even people who've done it in some parts, are, we're all so talented in so many areas that the chance of really doing justice to what's inside everybody, almost no one manages that in, in the course of a life. And so it's a great tragedy that a lot of us, perhaps most of us, go to our deaths not having been able to exploit or draw out the most sincere and talented parts of us. The problem with our minds is our minds are vague. That the great error of our, you know, we, look, we're all evolved apes, but the ape side of us is not too far away. Our brains have evolved to take immediate decisions according to stimuli that are right in front of us. A lot of life nowadays demands long-term thinking and analysis that is not going to be based simply on emotional gut instinct. This kind of thinking is really hard. Like if you ask the mind to do that, it goes, oh, can't I look at Twitter? No, sit down, think harder. And it doesn't want to do that kind of thinking, but it's really important to do it. My advice is beware of your own brains. They can be very misleading and create a kind of structure, a safe zone where the errors of the mind can be tested and refined and you know, evaporated before they become too serious and the wrong decisions are, are taken. I think we need to tell our young people, um, especially you know, young children from an early age, first of all say, look guys, there's not much time. You've got this talent inside of you. So everything about education must be about getting to the stage where age 20, 21, 22, you're, you're starting to uh, know what some of these key talents are and you're able to train in those areas. Um, and it could be quite an unusual thing, but you, know, you need to kind of know yourself. So everything, working backwards from that, everything needs to have that goal in mind. And so this means having wide experience, trying a lot of things from a very young age, being exposed to a lot of different uh, industries, sectors, people. You know, if you're a doctor, introduce your kid to a sailor. If you're a sailor, introduce your kid to a priest. If you're a priest, introduce your kid to an IT spec. Well, not kid, you know what I'm saying. Um, uh, that kind of thing. So, so to get a broad experience, because families are tunnels and it's very important for the tunnel always to try and, and be opened. Um, and tell your kids, you know, work hard at school, but also working hard at school is only a small part of the puzzle. Uh, you can be the most brilliant student, but if you've got the wrong mentality, um, you're not going to succeed. You need a certain impatience with the rules and a respect for the rules. Too much respect and actually you become a sheep, a brilliant sheep, but still a sheep. And sheep have limited lives. Uh, but too much untrained brilliance and you shoot off like a rocket that's not been properly calibrated. church was an amazing institution. If you think of the buildings, the schools, the universities, the networks, the, the political influence, etc., it was amazing. I mean, any student of management should look at the church as the supreme you know, institution and organization. I mean, there's nothing like it on earth. Uh, that has lasted so long. People say things like, the church is corrupt. Yeah, of course it's corrupt. You know, it's, it's gone through many crises. Think of an average organization. An average, an average business lasts 10 years, and in those 10 years, it will probably go through two years of utter corruption and collapse. I mean, so it's doing quite well, the church, in, in, you know, in grander terms. So uh, nevertheless, unfortunately, there's one big problem with the church. They really believe in God. I wish they didn't, but I think they really do. Um, it, it, you know, I come from England. The Church of England is probably the most secular. I mean, most priests come out at some point in the Church of England and say things like, well, Jesus wasn't really supernatural. He was kind of like a really nice man. But, you know, when push comes to shove, these guys still tell you that Jesus is the Son of God. And for most people, me included, uh, in the age of science, it's just not going to work. And this was the crisis of the 19th century, particularly in Germany. Uh, you know, this is where Nietzsche comes from, the death of God, etc. It's just not going to be possible to persuade most people in an age of science, all the supernatural bits of religion will just disappear. This is a real pity because there's so much else around religion which is fantastic. 
the gatherings, the sense of community, the support, the kind of pastoral care, it's all great. Um, but it's just hooked up to this, you know, very unfortunate thing. I think we need forgiveness. This is what the church always understood, that if you're going to have justice, you need forgiveness. Otherwise, you have to lock up pretty much everybody, um, because everybody has done bad stuff. And if you examine everyone under a microscope, and you don't give them any leeway, so anything they say on social media, any indiscretion they might have committed 15 years ago, anything like that, if you make a drama out of this, humiliate them, etc. you're going to make, start making life really difficult. And I worry that we're advancing towards a world, particularly in the United States, of zero forgiveness. I'm not saying indiscretion should be allowed, but there should be a process from sin to forgiveness to moving on. Uh, and this has always been how societies dealt with things. You know, village elders would gather around, somebody would have done something wrong, it would be worked through. I worry about our capacity as a society to work through things. Largely it's the work of the media, uh, whose energies are all spent in the exploitation and humiliation of people, and has no interest in improvement. Because ultimately what we need to do is to improve people, not just condemn them. The first thought is always be, how do we avoid this happening again? What do we learn from it? How do we move on? Rather than, ha ha, what an idiot. Self-knowledge is absolutely key to understand ourselves, is the thing, the puzzle. Once we work that out, uh, a lot of things become clearer. Um, it's very, very hard. We don't have anything like the support structure, the institutions, the guidance we need to achieve this. Most of us are walking around blind and ignorant. No wonder we make catastrophic mistakes and regularly blow up our lives and the lives of others around us, even those we care about. Um, we are steering blind. Uh, this is part of the tragedy of the human condition at the moment. However, there are reasons to be hopeful. Uh, the good scenario uh, involves various bits of technology allied with various bits of philosophy. So, um, you know, there's a real chance that we will get energy prices down to almost zero, um, that many of the basic struggles for survival will be solved, um, that economics as we see it today in a very bad place will you know, be solved. So there's a kind of Switzerland option. We will still have all kinds of human problems. Hopefully our brains, these walnuts that sit on top of our spinal columns, we'll be getting a handle on them. Neuroscience, uh, psychology, artificial intelligence will be giving us more of a handle on why we're crazy and how we're crazy. And we still live in societies where, you know, we have the therapist, we have drugs. A lot of people are on drugs. Why are they on drugs? Because they don't know how to control their minds. Drugs are a horribly crude, uh, violent attempt to control minds. My hope is that with time we'll be able to make more use of our minds, control our minds in more productive ways. We're on the cusp of a really exciting age where we're going to move away from the idea of technology as merely distracting us and feeding us things we don't need towards an idea of uh, what I like to call, think of as emotional technology, in other words, technology that is properly adapted to us and our emotional needs. Many of the tools we have now, think of the world of dating or friendship or uh, messaging, etc. These things are still very random. You know, we'll look back on them as very rough. And they do, you know, when we complain and say they've distracted us, what we're really saying is they haven't engaged with the most fundamental parts of us. But I look forward to a time where technology is able to help us in the really big areas, guiding us towards um, our biggest talents, uniting us with um, the areas of the workplace where we have the most to contribute, uh, helping us to interpret our emotions and communicate those emotions to others. Um, you know, we're on the cusp of some major discoveries in the world of artificial intelligence, and this will have an impact on the way that we think about ourselves, communicate with others. Up till now, we've had this thing called art, uh, and art is the main tool with which we understand ourselves and communicate. Um, I think we're gonna see, in many ways, a merger of art and technology in the area of emotional intelligence.